Hello, everyone. Dave here. As many of you know, in addition to hosting our shows here at the Cyberwire, I am also the host of the Recorded Future podcast, where we have conversations with interesting and influential people in cybersecurity, as well as discussions about threat intelligence. We recently celebrated our 100th episode of the Recorded Future podcast, and our special guest was The Grug, a well-known and respected voice in the hacker community. We're sharing that episode with you here today, a special bonus show courtesy of Recorded Future. Enjoy. This is Recorded Future, inside threat intelligence for cybersecurity. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 100 of the Recorded Future podcast. I'm Dave Bittner from the Cyberwire. To celebrate 100 episodes of our show, we've got a special guest this week. The Grug is well known in hacker and information security circles around the world and a respected voice at conferences and on social media. He's a bit mysterious, preferring to keep his real name under wraps. The Grug joins us this week to discuss influence operations, their history, why they work, and how recent examples like the Russian meddling in the 2016 U.S. elections might be a sign of things to come. Stay with us. I've basically uh, just been a hacker for the last 20 years or so. Um, there's, there's not really, from my point of view, much else to say, but uh, that encompasses quite a lot, actually. Um, I've been involved in, uh, you know, reverse engineering, pen testing, red teaming, developing products, uh, offensive, defensive, worked at startups, worked at enterprises. Um, I've studied uh, threat actors. I've been uh, developing, you know, denial and deception systems. Um, basically, I've done everything in cyber that a civilian can do. For, for folks who are curious, I mean, why the pseudonym? Why do you prefer to uh, stay anonymous? Um, I've just been using it since uh, I started, and gradually everyone else has switched to using their real names, and I sort of just never got around to it. Uh, also, there's uh, in about 2003 or 2004, a uh, friend of mine, a, a reverse engineer, um, was giving a talk, and uh, this guy is called uh, Fravia. He was pretty famous uh, back in the day. So he was giving a talk at a college. Uh, I went to go and see it, and when he came out, um, he said, you know, uh, the only people left using handles are you and me. And uh, a couple years later, he died of throat cancer. So... Um, I'm the only person left, so I, I kind of feel this dumb obligation to keep it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, it does. It does. I think also add a probably a certain amount of mystique or uh, uh, swagger to mm. your street cred. Yeah, there's there's nothing as good for your street cred as using the exact same nickname when you're 40 as when you're 14. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the focus of our conversation today is going to be influence operations. Um, and I want to start at the beginning there, with looking back at some of the history of that. Can you sort of uh, give us a little bit of a history lesson? What is the history of information warfare? Um, so what's great about information warfare is, in many ways, it's as old as language. Information warfare has been part of the repertoire of spying and espionage. Uh, as we joke, uh, spying is the second oldest profession. So uh, Infowar has been with us since forever. What's, what's really fascinating is if you, if you dig into the history before it was known as Infowar, just regular history about uh, military conflicts, you'll find that um, what is now considered, you know, best practices and documented in the manuals is applied, you know, uh, 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago. So uh, Herodotus uh, has a, um, a story about uh, the, the Athenians and how um, they left a message for uh, these 
Greek allies of the Persians, and they they wrote it on a rock saying, you know, um, we're we're all Greeks, we're friends, you know, you don't need to fight us so hard, you know, run away if you can, or act sick, or you know, hold back in battle. When you develop a message for Infowar, you you have to see it from the point of view of uh, the adversary, sort of the, the the target, the person who is going to be uh, reading it and consuming it. And you need to write, you need to develop a message that resonates with them, that has, you know, it's from their point of view, it has their best interest at heart. Um, it's about them, not about you. And all of that has stayed the same since, you know, humans have been humans. There's, there's nothing that's changed fundamentally about how to manipulate a human being. What's interesting, of course, is now the internet has given us um, the opportunity to go from writing on a rock and kind of hoping someone sees it to, you know, internet scale, micro-targeted infowar. You can literally target your message and tailor it to every single person. And that is very, very fascinating. Like, um, that's really changed the game. So one of the, the important ways that the internet has changed Infowar is in feedback. The ability of the propagandist or the person uh, creating the message to tell whether their message is actually resonating, if it's, if it's meeting um, and working with the person that is consuming it. So historically, the way that you had to do it was you had to get someone who is effectively a one-to-one -one copy of your adversary, except he was on your side. Someone who, you know, was a German, but was, you know, loyal to Britain, for example. Mm. Um, and you'd have to get them to sort of be creative and imagine and, and come up with these ideas and then just hope that it worked. Uh, these days you could just do A-B testing because... Everything is instantaneous feedback, which allows you to actually uh, custom tailor your message in real time. You can show up. You don't need to know anything about your target. And you could just throw things out there and allow um, the way that people engage with your message to craft your info war for you. One of the one of the sayings that uh, Sefton Delmer had, the uh, like the genius of black propaganda is um, you can't bomb a currency, but you can destroy it with a whisper. Hmm. And that has, that has carried over. I mean, there's the hard power and soft power, and soft power has stayed the same. So the whispers that they did, uh, actually, there's, there's a guide to how to craft whispers and uh, rumors, and those that guide, it's completely current. That's how to make conspiracy theories. It's literally, it doesn't need to change a word and it's still accurate. Uh, one of the things that the uh, British were doing was they were making up fake uh, ration books. They were, they were duplicating the ration books for uh, Germany and they were dropping those and um, people were actually using them and they were incredibly good. I mean, there's, there was no way to tell them apart from the legitimate thing. But uh, what Goebbels did, because he had to counter this, was he had uh, very, very bad fake ration books made up. And he, uh, he displayed these and said, you know, like these, these dumb British think that they can make the sort of junk and, um, you know, people would fall for it. And clearly, you know, no German would ever do something like that. And by the way, there's also the death penalty if you try. <laughs> so, um, you know, like they, they, they countered in the same way. So it was these, these two uh, states talking to each other through the medium of uh, false information. Well, it's interesting. I mean, uh, let, let's, let's pivot and, and talk about uh, the interference from Russia in the 2016 presidential campaign here in the U.S., uh, certainly one of the major stories from the past few years. And depending on who you ask, some people say it had a very low impact. Others argue that it could have compromised the entire election. What is your take on that that uh, information campaign? Yeah, so um, it, it absolutely has been the coolest thing to happen 
to cyber in a long time. What's really interesting about the uh, Russian meddling, as it's now called, but uh, the, the Russian influence campaign, was that um, initially while it was going on, there were a number of people um, in the information security community and uh, I assume in other communities as well, who knew what was happening and were calling it out. But um, because, you know, you can only really do so much against the state if a state is doing an influence campaign and you're, you know, a few people who know the truth, uh, you don't really have a platform to uh, counteract that. So right after the election, when the Russians were like, all right, we're done, you know, we don't need to do this anymore. And everyone sort of started to go, wait a minute, something happened. And, you know, uh, Facebook came out and said, you know, the idea that our targeted ads that are our lifeblood can in any way influence people's, um, you know, opinions is ludicrous, <laughs> right? Then it's now sort of in some circles, it's gone to this sort of other extreme where there's like a red under every bed, you know, the, the Russians are this all-seeing, uh, omniscient, omnipotent, you know, they, they, um, they crafted and directed everything. Whereas a lot of that campaign was actually kind of a shambles. It was very much sort of day-to-day, skin-of-the-teeth thing, you know. Um, a, a lot of their stuff actually failed, you know, uh, people people have been talking about how there was this meme war, that these memes were like the, the great, terrible things that we don't know what to do with. But if you actually look at the memes that the Russians were producing, um, they're not memes as we know them from the internet. You know, they're, they're not sort of uh, jokes or reusing templates and things like that. They're basically just straight up World War II propaganda posters. Hillary is bad and with Satan and Trump is good. You know, choose good. Like that's not a meme. Uh, together we can defeat the devil Hillary. You know, like th- these are slogans that you would see pasted up in um, a-, a poster from, you know, World War II. This is not novel, exciting you know, futuristic stuff. It's 70-year-old garbage. But how and, much were uh, they taking advantage of, of that ability to iterate? This is the other thing. Even though they had the capability, they did not do it electronically. Mm. Right? They, they didn't do it digitally. They, they did iterate. They did 24-hour iterations. They do amplification. They're Johnny-come-latelys. Um, they wait until something is sort of starting to crest and come up in the target audience, and then they throw their weight behind that, right? So they they don't, um, people have said, you know, like they throw spaghetti against the wall and sees what sticks. That's not true. They look at the wall, see what spaghetti has stuck, and then they go for that. Hmm. Um, So they're, they're actually slow movers, which, you know, despite being slow movers and coming after everything else, they actually still operate far faster than any government could respond. I mean, um, pick one agency that can operate on a 24-hour loop and iterate and respond at that speed. It's, you know, the way that they work technically is there's a group of managers who set the direction. Um, There's a data analytics group who would look at what was going on, look at which stories were doing well, uh, what was coming up, present this, the managers would sort of read it in the morning, then they'd come up and say like, okay, these are the themes that we're going to go with and these are the stories we're going to amplify. They distribute that and their team of 80 people would go ahead and do that for the next 24 hours until the next meeting the next day. Right. So it, it wasn't very fast. It wasn't very automated. Um, it wasn't very impressive. You know, it's uh, very, very analog, but it still took advantage of that instantaneous feedback to have uh, the data analytics gave them that very, very fast response capability, hmm. uh, the ability to see what was working, what wasn't. So they took advantage of that, but they weren't doing A-B testing. 
which I, I find very, very disappointing. How do you then determine how successful they were? And uh, I guess part of me wonders, with as tight an election as this was, as divided as Americans were, yeah. it, it, was it a situation where the Russians didn't have to be all that good and still have a meaningful effect on things? Right, right. So, I mean, unfortunately, there's so many variables involved. It's not possible to tell whether they were sort of like the, the, the deciding factor or not. Um, I tend to think that given how close it was and the fact that they had an impact of some sort, they, like, while they might not be the deciding factor, they were a deciding factor. Um, and yeah, they did not need to be particularly good because uh, Americans have been polarizing themselves so well for so long that you know, <laughs> the Russians don't really need to come in and be like, hey, you guys should hate each other now. They just need to come in and, you know, pick a side. Right. Um, and that that worked incredibly well for them. And that's sort of part of the, the holdover, the consequence of the political environment that's been developing for years. Uh, I, I think actually one of the problems that the Russians have is they, they overextended, you know, they, they played their hand in 2016, the Russian playbook is now known, um, and they were too successful. And so they've sort of had this pyrrhic victory of people don't trust anything that comes from Sputnik or RT anymore, because it's now known that they are propaganda outlets. Um, and the playbook that they've developed, everyone else is adopting it. So it's escaped into their wild and people are going to use it. So I, I think they actually got an own goal in a way. Like they didn't really benefit by having Trump in charge. They would have been better off with a, a weak Democrat than uh, someone who is uh, throws temper tantrums and so on. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the, the the Russian playbook has escaped into the wild. Other people can copy it. And the ability of the Russians to reuse it has been reduced because now everyone is alert and watching out for it. So they've, you know, increased the difficulty of doing it again and they've gotten very little for it. So I, I think they probably are not thrilled with the results. Yeah. Right? Now, but has there been any effective countering of this type of stuff i mean the, in the modern age in the post internet age what are we seeing in terms of nation states effectively countering this uh there's sort of there's two answers to that one of them is um we haven't seen a sort of a face off a mano a mano um stare down contest between two nation states in info war. So we don't know that yet. But um, there have been cases where uh, Russia has failed fairly catastrophically. Hmm. Um, France is a good example of that. There's different theories as to why the uh, Macron likes to say that it's because they had this clever IT defense stuff. Um, I say that it's because there was basically nothing to find on the guy that no one expected to get anywhere. Information warfare attacks take a lot of preparation time. You need to do a lot of research. You need to have a lot of material. You know, you need to prepare all this stuff, get your narratives ready, and then uh, build up your channels, get good credibility, and so on. And if this dark horse comes out of nowhere and you have no background material on them, you don't have the time to develop any of those things. Mm. So they, they didn't have chance. Like they, they just didn't have the time for it. So uh, they did the only thing that they could do, which is they, they waited until the absolute very last minute throughout everything that they did have and just kind of hoped for the best. And, uh, Obviously, that wasn't that wasn't going to have any impact. Hmm. What what I see going forward is um, there's there's several things that have happened that that mean that information war fights uh, are going to happen. Uh, right now, there's actually a info war being fought. There's this huge cyber diplomatic uh, information war being fought 
in uh, the Middle East. And it's really interesting for two reasons. One is that despite being really heated in terms of uh, how much data they're throwing around, the amount of hacking going on, it's basically not having any impact. Right? It, it has no effect. Hmm. So, you know, the, the volume of stuff going on doesn't necessarily have an impact on uh, the visibility of the war. And so uh, from, from that point of view, at least, the, the fight is a complete failure for everyone involved. Why do you think um, it's not having an effect? I, I think Trump is sucking the air out of the room, hmm. um, to be honest. But the, the other thing is things that are fascinating to people that live in the Gulf, you know, like um, this sheikh's son is being monitored by an Israeli firm uh, for surveillance. Like, that's a big thing, but try getting anyone internationally to care. You know, mm. like the the problem the, the problem is that the these are all regional topics that they're trying to blow up, that they're trying to use, and it's not working because within the region itself, you know, uh, the lines are clear. You're either a Saudi or you're an Emirati or a Qatar. You know, like you 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 are where you are. You're not going to change your mind or um, be polarized or whatever. Hmm. So regionally, the, the attacks have no impact. And internationally, they are not interesting enough to have an impact. Um, the, the only one that did, and this one I, I think needs to be studied more because it's absolutely fascinating. And um, I, I think in a way it, it suggests what the future of uh, information operations could be. It was the, the hack of the uh, Qatar news agency, so QNA. And uh, what happened was um, Saudi Arabia and uh, the UAE and a bunch of other countries sort of needed this pretext to have a diplomatic spat and isolate Qatar. They, they basically wanted to say, you know, like they, they cut off the airspace, they cut off uh, the ports, they wanted to, to lay siege basically. Mm -hmm. Um, and they needed a, a pretext for that because you can't just sort of randomly um, declare all-out diplomatic war on a, a nation for no reason. So what they did was they hacked the Qatar news agency and they inserted a fake interview with a uh, leader of Qatar basically saying um, horrible things, hmm. you know, uh, you know, we support terrorists, um, which would cause a diplomatic incident were it to be true. And what's what's really cool is the way that they went around doing it was uh, they took over the TV broadcasting. Hmm. So Q&A has, you know, they've got a Twitter account, they've got a website, and um, they have a, uh, a TV station. And the TV station was taken over and the, the Chiron, that sort of scrolling text along the bottom, yep. was replaced to have, basically they were inserting uh, excerpts from this interview saying, you know, like, so, so and so says, um, you know, we support terrorism. Hmm. So and so says, you know, uh, so and so. So to, to give the impression that this was a, a real authentic mm -hmm. thing, uh, they also posted news articles on the website with the interview, uh, it looked authentic. It was legitimately part of the the, the, the website. It, it looked like this was a real story that had come out. And they sent it out on Twitter, and then they locked the Twitter so that um, the, the real Q&A could not go and delete it. So this was sort of like a, a, a full spectrum info war. You know, they, they got TV, they got Twitter, they got the website, and they took over a news station to do this. So they, they took over an authentic, credible channel. You know, I, I think in terms of the, the, the future of InfoWar, it doesn't need to just be a Facebook ad. You know, like you, you've got that A-B testing, micro-targeting capability with immediate feedback with an ad. But if you take over a legitimate news station and you create a story, you know, and, and you 
put it up in the way that it should be done with. Like there's, you know, there's uh, tweets that come out. Um, yeah, g give people the ability uh, to, to sort of fact yeah. check it via other channels. Yeah, right. So it, 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 you, you make it look like any big breaking story you'd have. Right. You know, the, the Chiron saying, you know, like coming up next, our exclusive uh, footage of this amazing thing that will make you have a particular emotion about a particular event or a particular person or whatever. Uh, you'd put up your, um, you know, your, your exclusive news article and you would put out links to it and it would just look completely authentic. And what's, what's great these days is people are so amazingly suspicious is that when it gets taken down, people won't go, oh, that was a fake thing and it's now been removed. Right. They'll go, what are they trying to cover right, up? Right, right. Yeah, you know? it amplifies the conspiracy. <laughs> There's not going to be an easy way of getting rid of this stuff because once you've pushed it out via that thing, you can immediately, uh, any, anything that they do, get rid of it. You know, they say, this was, this was fake, this isn't happening. You know, you can amplify on top of that. Every time it comes up, it's an opportunity to remind people of this yeah. thing. And it, I think that's going to be absolutely devastating. And that's next. Do, do you suppose <laughs> that uh, any of these attempts with organizations like Facebook or Twitter, you know, they're, they're making a lot of noise about uh, efforts to reduce fake news and filter these sorts of things out. Do you think that's possible? One of, one of the things that's been interesting is um, fake news turns out not to be a particularly big deal. In, in research, it was found that the, the people reading and sharing fake news were the sort of, they're over 65, um, they were less than, you know, uh, they were a very, very tiny percentage of the population. They were hardcore right-wing and they shared the stuff back and forth between each other, and no one else really interacted with it. So the the fake news thing is a bit of a red herring. Yeah. What's what's more insidious with with info war? Um, proper information warfare doesn't lie. You know, you 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 never lie if you can tell the truth. Um, and the trick is uh, framing. So you you frame the truth or uh, you give a half truth, you don't give the, the full context. Like the, the classic ex example would be uh, in the, the UK, there's a sort of, there's a right-wing uh, newspaper and a left-wing newspaper. If the Air Force released, um, you know, 80% of uh, smart bombs hit their targets, there would be uh, from the right-wing, you know, um, unbelievable accuracy of spark bombs, whereas on the left wing, it would be um, almost 25% of smart bombs fail to hit mm. targets, you know, and that's, that's just framing and both of them are factually correct. And that is going to be the problem that Facebook and Twitter have is that it's not going to be people putting false information out. It's going to be people putting true information, but sort of couched in a way that causes an emotive reaction um, from the target audience that is the one that the propagandist wants. Mm. And I don't, I don't see how they're ever going to be able to deal with that. Mm. Uh, just because, you know, you, you need to have editors, you need to have human editors in the way. And that's, that's one of the things that uh, we've lost. So um, for the last hundred years, we've had mass broadcasting has been, uh, you know, this, this mass media has been the way that uh, populations stay informed, that they, they get their news. And that used to be divided up into, you know, there'd be um, the newspaper and there'd be like a morning edition or an evening edition. Um, and that sort of kept everyone roughly with, with the same level of shared knowledge, it gave uh, people like a basic set of information. Mm -hmm. um, radio would have, uh, you know, their news hour or their news programs. And uh, this kept people synchronized with uh, information. And then there was TV, which, you know, like the news at seven, the news at 11 and so on. And again, people were synchronized 
in when they were receiving information and when they were learning about what, what was going on. So your entire audience, which um, you know ended up being sort of nationwide, your entire audience has the same basic set of facts from you know two or three possible sources. And you know that's why you get like a, a Walter Cronkite. You know, this this person gives you the truth. That's the way the world is. And he does it at a specific time. And everyone knows that what he says, that's how it is. And these days, you don't have that. You know, the, it's been desynchronized because there's the 24-hour news cycle of uh, cable news where they're just, they have to have stuff on all the time. So people are already sort of fractured depending on... Uh, if they watch cable news, which channels they watch, what time they watch it. Um, newspapers are shrinking. Uh, there's fewer of them. You're not getting, you know, three editions every day from the same page. Like that, newspapers are sort of um, not a, a great way of establishing uh, foundational truth for a population. Mm -hmm. And to make, to make it worse is because the internet now has completely desynchronized people and created these uh, social tribal groups where you associate with people um, not because you were geographically located, right? So historically, a tribe or a village would be um, you and everyone that was born in that area. And your authentication for information from these people was you grew up with them. So you knew everyone and whether you could trust this guy or not. But these days, uh, we still have... The, the sense of being part of a village or a tribal group. However, we do not have that authenticity of knowing who we're actually talking to. That's it. Like we're, we're a global virtual village with a large number of tribes and an infinite number of villages made up of people who don't actually know each other, who basically have to take on faith what's being told to them I'm curious, you know, what is your message to folks out there? Is there a way to in inoculate themselves? Is there a way to, to do a better job of knowing when they might be uh, a victim of this sort of thing? And, you know, how, 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 what, what's the appropriate level of, uh, for lack of a better word, anxiety to dial in about this? That's actually quite a hard one. So, you know, what, one, of, one of the easy ones is... Um, if there's a piece of substantive news, it should occur in at least two separate newspapers. You know, if there's if you only single source, then um, you're, you're at risk. But the the difficult thing is not necessarily being cautious and doubting the information that is given to you by people you disagree with, but it's the people who you agree with that are going to be the ones that push you further away. Hmm. That's that's how um, good info war works. As you go in as part of the in-group and you put um, you know your own messaging in there. So I, I guess um, the the takeaway message is just to be a lot more skeptical of what people say and slow down. It's not that important. Yeah. You don't need to rush into things. You know, wait until it's been verified and fact-checked before you commit. And um, yeah, watch, watch out for the people that you agree with. Our thanks to The Grug for joining us for this special 100th episode of our Recorded Future podcast. Don't forget to sign up for the Recorded Future Cyber Daily email, where every day you'll receive the top results for trending technical indicators that are crossing the web, Cyber news, targeted industries, threat actors, exploited vulnerabilities, malware, suspicious IP addresses, and much more. You can find that at recordedfuture.com slash intel. We hope you've enjoyed the show and that you'll subscribe and help spread the word among your colleagues and online. The Recorded Future podcast team includes coordinating producer Zane Picorni, executive producer Greg Barrett. The show is produced by The Cyberwire with editor John Petrick, executive producer Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. Thank you.